Suffering and the Christian Life We must embrace suffering as Christians. We suffer on many levels. Suffering comes from external and internal sources. It results from things people do to us and from our own choices. The common denominator is sin. Both external and internal sinful choices and behaviors produce suffering. We suffer with and for God. Suffering with God involves living in a fallen world where internal and external sources precipitate the suffering. Jesus completed his suffering here on earth, but he is touched by our hardships. He feels the pain as we suffer. He suffers with us. The more we live out our lives as Christians, the more we understand the sufferings with Christ. We identify with our Savior. He suffered. We suffer. We suffer because he suffered. John 15:18 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Paul eloquently describes this hunger for Christ, being identified with him and striving for deeper intimacy with him. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Philippians 3.10 The more suffering we experience, the more Christ-like we become. Suffering for God involves persecution. Suffering in this world makes us more Christ-like. There's no way out but through. As we embrace suffering in this world, we embrace Christ. It's God's plan. We should always believe God for healing. He is still in the healing business. Pray, believing that God is able and willing to heal you or someone else. Pray to the end if need be, believing God for miraculous healing. Sometimes God does not heal people. They suffer. The physical and emotional pain lingers. People die, even though believers prayed for healing. Does this mean the afflicted ones or praying believers didn't have enough faith? Certainly not. The most devout believers suffer illnesses to the end. They are not second-class Christians. Paul Bilheimer's book, Don't Waste Your Sorrows, is the best book I ever read on this subject. He covers this difficult topic extremely well, offering a powerfully fresh explanation on the purpose for suffering and challenges us not to waste our sorrows. Bilheimer says, Must one who is not healed suffer with a sense of spiritual inferiority and the disappointing suspicion that he can have only God's second best while a select minority who are healed and blessed with affluence pass as God's chosen few? Or is it possible for the great majority who remain financially limited or physically afflicted to make as great a contribution to the kingdom and bring as much joy to the heart of God and win as great an eternal reward as those who are favored with the supernatural deliverance here and now. We will look at this more in the next section. Let's go back to Job for a moment. Job defended his righteousness before his friends, but not before God. God begins talking in Job chapter 38. He goes on for a while asking Job all kinds of questions. Then, in chapter 40, God says, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. That's in Job 40, verse 2. Job responds and says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. That's in Job 40, verses 4 and 5. Then God challenges Job again in the same chapter, verse 7, saying, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. God speaks again for another two chapters, 
before Job repents, saying, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak, you said. I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. Basically, Job gets the sovereignty of God. He relents and repents. Even though Job did not sin to cause his sufferings, I believe he took his defense proclamation of innocence and righteousness too far. He knew he was righteous and questioned why this happened. Is it wrong to vent our anger, frustration, and sadness to God? We must be careful and remember He is good. He is sovereign. He must not st we must not stay stuck there. God understands our sufferings, sorrows, and anger. Don't go too far and too long in holding hard feelings towards God about your sufferings. He loves you and will not punish you for verbalizing your feelings towards Him about your situation. Just don't linger there. It's counterproductive. He can handle your anger, but does not want the sun to go down on your anger.